first of all, Deshaun, thank you so much for that kind introduction. It's an honor to meet you and good to, good to call you a friend. And I uh, really appreciate it. A lot of friends in the room, John, uh, Thomas's, and I would be remiss if I, I mean, there's so many, Tim, I mean, there's so many friends in the, in the room, Dr. Wade. Uh, I really appreciate the honor to be with you here today, this afternoon. We're 60 days away from Election Day. And uh, there's often times where I've asked, you know, why are you running for office? Why do you go through what you go through? And, and can one person really make a difference? And, and my answer to that is yes. But the best way to kind of describe who I am is, um, and what I'm going to do when I'm in Washington is for you to understand who I am as a person, deep in my heart. A lot of people talk about heroes in life. Uh, and I think in heroes is used very loosely. Um, some people talk about sports athletes. Um, I'm a big sports fan, but they talk about sports athletes, they talk about movie stars. But let me tell you who the hero is in my life. My hero in my life is my dad, Sergeant First Class Donald Strickland. See, my dad served in Korea and Vietnam, and after he got injured in Vietnam, he became a drill sergeant at Fort Ord, where I was born, in Monterey, California. Now, you can imagine what it was like as a little kid growing up with a drill sergeant as a father. <laughs> every, minute, every minute I was late, when I was growing up as a kid, I was granted a week. And I never got time off for good behavior. <laughs> In fact, my friends, my friends were so scared to come over to my house. They used to call my home Strick Land. <laughs> um, <laughs> to this day, to this day. I still, my, my dad is in, in his mid-70s, older 70s, he can still whoop my butt, and I'm still a little scared of my dad. But the biggest lesson I learned from my father is it's up to every generation to leave your city, state, and nation in a better spot than what you found. Fight for something bigger than yourself. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, uh, no time is more important than these next 60 days. Today is my boy, we call him Tiny Tony. It's his fifth birthday. Today is my boy's fifth birthday. And I see that smile on his face every morning. And today was no different. In fact, today he was up about 5.45, 6 o'clock, was so energetic about his birthday. And he said, Daddy, I'm five. I'm five. And my little girl's turning seven in October. Every generation before me has left their generation in a better spot than what they found. This is the first time in American history where that's in question. Is my boy, Tiny Tony, and is my girl, Ruby Ruth, and is your kids and our grandkids going to have a better future than what we have? And that's what's at stake in the next 60 days. Will my boy, will my children, and your children, have the same opportunities I had? I grew up here in California. I love this state. I think California's worth fighting for. Will they have the same opportunities uh, to be successful? After my dad uh, uh, retired from the military, he became a maintenance man. Worked with his hands, and my first job was washing wheelchairs at a nursing home. And my dad had always taught me that through hard work, you can achieve anything. My grandmother, who's not with us today, used to take me to Disneyland every every birthday I ever had. And I remember when I was a little kid, I said I was going to be a pro basketball player. I said I'm interested in government. And I remember my grandmother saying, Tony, she used to call me Anthony actually. She said, you can achieve anything in life that you set your goal, goal to as long as you're willing to work for it. And that's what the American dream is about. It's no matter what station in life you're in. And I have to tell you, I wouldn't be in the state senate, and I wouldn't be in the state assembly if it wasn't for the discipline of my father and the support of my mom, who's the immigrant to Germany, who got my dad over there. I'm able to say that I'm 60 days away from being in Congress because of support, but also because of how great this country is and how opportunities. There's so many successful people in this room. But that's what's at stake in this next 60 days. You know, as Obama said, that you didn't build it, uh, that the private sector's doing fine. Well, the private sector's not doing fine. In fact, the job numbers came out, and this is the longest sustained unemployment rate over 8% that we've ever had since we've been reporting since 1948. <coughs> and that's what's at stake in the next 60 days. Now, I'm running for Congress because I want to make a difference. I want to make a difference. Every now and then, when I'm in the state Senate, I'm outnumbered, as you can imagine. Um, <laughs> but I fight the fight, because I think it's important to fight the fight. As John mentioned, um, in, in the State Assembly, you know, I do what I think is right. 
and uh, just kind of give you a flavor of kind of leadership you'll have in me if I'm lucky enough to get across the finish line in this race. The best indication of future performance is past. And I'm very proud of my record in Sacramento. And I think nothing crystallized, crystallized the leadership that you'll have in me in Congress than this quick story. How many people remember the energy crisis? So, during the, <laughs> the recent energy crisis, we have many energy crises, you're right. Uh, I, was, I, was a, I was the youngest member of the California legislature in the state assembly. I was still in my 20s when Gray Davis locked the state into these long term power contracts, these 20, 30 year energy contracts. And believe it or not, at that time, people were talking about Gray Davis being the next president of the United States. I know it's hard to believe today, but it made sense back then because he just got done beating Dan Lugger by 22 percentage points. He was the most prolific fundraiser of the Democratic Party and also the governor of the largest state. And everybody in Sacramento was talking about Gray Davis will be the next president of the United States. That's where we were at this time. And at the time, Gray Davis refused to disclose what he's spending these long-term power contracts, these energy contracts. I remember I went right to the governor and I said, Governor, this is not your money, it's not my money, it's the people's money. They have a right to know how much it's costing to keep the lights on here in the state of California. And the governor refused to disclose what we were spending to keep the lights on in the state. So I did the only thing I thought I could do at the time. I took him to court in a lawsuit, because he said executive privilege. I took him to court in a lawsuit. You can Google it today, Strickland v. Davis. And I remember like it was yesterday, walking into my assembly caucus. These are the Republicans. Everybody came together. I walk in, you can imagine, I'm the youngest member of the state, I'm in my twenties, I walk in and I say, I'm suing the governor of California. Who's with me? <laughs> <laughs> say I didn't get a warm response is an understatement. In fact, a couple of my colleagues, Republican colleagues, took me outside afterwards, they put their arm around me, and they said, Tony, Tony, you can't do this. You can't sue the governor. If you sue the governor and go forward with this lawsuit, you're going to be in the worst office in the Capitol building. Every piece of legislation you have, the governor's going to veto it. And this guy's going to be president of the United States. You're going to end your political career before you even get started. We think you have a future. You need to drop this because you won't have a future if you go forward with this lawsuit. And I said at the time, you know what? I didn't get elected to go along and get along. I got elected to do the right thing. And I remember my father. My father was a father. And so, I went in alone. I said, this is the right thing to do, and I sued the governor court, in court. Not only did I sue the governor, we won the court case. And what happened then was the governor had to, to release the documents. And what we found out was through Enron and other energy companies that what happened was they locked in these long-term power contracts at a higher price, and the worst price during the spot market during the energy crisis. So what Greg Davis was willing to do is have us for 20 or 30 years to get out of a political football that he had at the current time. Well, he had bad PR. The energy companies had bad PR. They went back to the negotiation table to get the bad PR. They renegotiated those contracts. And we say great payers, all of us in this room, billions of dollars for the next 20 or 30 years. Because we have the courage to do the right thing to get that done. And all I'm trying to tell you by that story is to give you a little bit of flavor. I think that's what's missing in Washington today. What's missing in Washington is people willing to stand and do the right thing, even if they're willing to take a risk on their political career. Too many people, the, the, the study just came, or a poll just came out and said the Congress has a 10% approval rate. And they asked, I was on the radio and they asked, well, what do you think about that? I said, I want to know who those 10% are. I think we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's too many, there's too many, there's too many <laughs> political games. And, and we lose the, the, the term as when I was growing up as a kid, as a statesman. A statesman. Ronald Reagan was a statesman. Ronald Reagan knew what he believed and fought for what he believed in. And he was a great uh, person to articulate and to lead. There's many different issues where Ronald Reagan was in the minority when he started. But he won over the mass of people through his leadership to get things done. I'll even point out a Democrat, John F. Kennedy. You all remember the speech. Or I wasn't around, I wasn't born at the time, but obviously seeing leadership, John F. Kennedy challenged the country in the early 1961, I believe. And he said, we're going to have a ban on the moon by the end of this decade. We need to have that kind of leadership back in Washington today. I think our challenge with man on the moon 
is be energy independent. Because I think it does not make sense that our country has no energy plan. Here. Think about it. We're sending billions of dollars to countries that don't like it. Take care of them. And we have abundant natural resources here at home. Not only is it a national security issue, it's a jobs and economic issue. Barack Obama stop, stopped the Keystone Pipeline. If you look at the Keystone Pipeline, that would create a million jobs off the top and produce a lot of energy. We need to bring in energy, and that will help drive that forward. If you want a true stimulus plan, it's not Obama's stimulus plan. Obama's stimulus plan is giving a whole bunch of debt, and we still have over 8% unemployment. If you want a true stimulus plan, we have over a trillion dollars of American corporations right now that are overseas. And right now, we charge a 35% tax. If any of those corporations, American corporations, want to bring that money back into the United States and reinvest, they would have to pay a 35% tax. So what happens is they don't bring that money back because of the tax, the way our tax structure works. And that trillion dollars is reinvested in China, Europe, South America. You want a true stimulus plan? Let's offer a tax incentive to say, OK, you need to, you need to lower those taxes and bring that trillion dollars back into the US economy. And then people will reinvest in America and go to China. Now, that would be fantastic because we'll be able to put people back to work and invest here in America. Now, I was asked on the radio, well, won't, won't, uh, won't, will they create jobs or will they just put it on the balance sheet? I said, a little bit of both, a little bit of both, but that's great. The balance sheet would be fantastic. There's another reason why people are apprehensive in this economy right now is they've invested in their independent retirement. And they've seen their, their investment go down. Now they have to work four years, and they, they want to retire a little bit early, but now they have to work an extra five, ten years because of the market. If you look at the pension obligation, the pension of CalSTRS, CalPERS, almost every one of the pension uh, uh, groups are investing in these companies. So it's got to be a good thing to bring back to the dollars, and you want a free market way of reinvigorating our economy. That's what we need to do to put people back to work. And then, uh, you know, lastly, uh, I'll just say we are at a crossroads right now in, in this campaign. My race, uh, as was mentioned, uh, I'm running the number one target race in the state of California. I used to have a big target on my back. A lot of my old friends were probably tired of me calling and asking for money. But four years ago, I ran uh, in, in uh, what became the most expensive legislative race in California history. Thirteen and a half million dollars was spent, uh, six on our side, six and a half on the Democrat side, for a state senate seat where Barack Obama won by 13 and a half points. Uh, if I would have lost that race, we would have lost the two-thirds majority in, in Sacramento. You wouldn't have this tax issue before you that uh, Jerry Brown's trying to push, because that would have that would have been passed and a lot whole lot more if we didn't win that race four years ago. So from the bottom of my heart I want to thank you. But we have a proven ability to win in tough districts. Barack Obama won by 13 and a half points. I should have lost four years ago. But I'll tell you this, no one works harder than me in a campaign. I get up in the morning, and uh, I, see, I know that there's uh, more park residents here, and there's a couple of thousand of residents here. You probably see me out waving at people as they go to work at 6 in the morning. You know, Pete Sessions, who's the chair of the NRCC, the National Republican Congressional Committee, has this great quote that I absolutely have adopted for my whole campaign. His quote is, winners do things that losers won't do. And winners will get out at 6 in the morning and wave at people going to work. Winners will walk that extra house and knock on that extra door. And winners will actually man that extra phone bank and turn out the phone. I've been doing that my whole career, but no more important race than this. The National Journal put out 20 different districts across the country that will determine whether Nancy Pelosi is the speaker or John Boehner. And I will tell you, it's going to be very tight. And I could be the deciding vote whether we repeal Obamacare, Nancy Pelosi's health care plan, or not. Um, that's what's at stake. And the National Journal put out these races. And uh, I always put it back in sports analogy because I played sports ever since I was a little kid. At the end of a basketball game, uh, when we were, we're in Coast Call Canal, we were down by a point, about 10 seconds left. We would go in the huddle, and we'd get in this huddle and drop the play. And I remember, ever since I was a little kid, I always did this to coach. I said, coach, Give me the ball and go to the game. If you want to win the game, make the play for me. I'll make the basket and we'll win the game. I want the ball in my hands. Because if the ball's in my hands, we're going to win. I'll tell you, when we talk about the future of this country, the ball's in my hands and it's your hands. 
you know, you don't have to worry about a race in Nevada, Ohio, when we're talking about the Congress. The race is right here at home. The ball is in all of our hands. And I will tell you this, if I get across the finish line, you're going to see me in Washington, you're going to get goosebumps. Because I will make a difference when I go back there. I'm not going just to be a vote. I'm going to make a difference. And you're going to say I had a small part, part, part to play in training this country around for our kids and grandkids. That's what's at stake in this election. I need you to stand with me. I need you to be on my team. I need your help and support. The National Democrats just put a million dollars, a million dollars of TV time, and every one of those dollars is going to be spent saying something negative about me in this district. I need to respond to that. So I need your help and support. If you're willing to come out and walk door to door, I'm happy to walk with you, and I'm happy my team have a great team. You will remain funding, and also we need resources. We need to raise about 300000 more to finish out our program. So you have the donor envelopes, you have my perspectives, but I will end with this. No one will make you more proud, no one will work harder to make sure that your dollar is stretched hard, further, and no one will fight harder in Washington, again, to turn around this country, to put it back on the right track, to once again bring in statesmen that are running for the right reasons, that are in office for the right reasons, to make a difference. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for being part of this Lincoln Club, helping uh, Alan Jackson in the next uh, VA, helping a lot of these camps that are running. But I need your help, I need your support, and together we'll be successful and turn this country back and make sure that our kids have that opportunity that we're fighting for. So thank you so much. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Sir. Who is the incumbent in this district, or is this a new district? It's a new district. All the districts are new. Uh, the way it was drawn, my district, is all of Ventura County, my city valley, and west of Rose Valley County. The current incumbent was a gentleman by the name of Elton Gowdy. So Elton Gowdy's been in office uh, since 1986. He's always had what we call a safe, safe district. And when these new lines came out, he looked at the seat, and he's been there since 1986, and he says, oh, my time is... Time, time for us to retire. And by the way, um, he had an opponent uh, who was a supervisor for Ventura, the city of Ventura, the uh, county board of supervisors, who was running against Congressman Galvin. And when Galvin retired, the supervisor raised 220000 from October to December of last year. So I announced mid-January, my goal on my announcement was to show strength right out of the gate. We have good name ideas. But I said, I want to raise that 220000 he raised in a couple months in one 24-hour period on my day of my announcement. The good news is we raised over that. We raised 380000 in the first 24 hours of this campaign. And the top-tier Democrat that the National Democrats recruited went to the Democrat convention and dropped out of the race because he had to give up his seat. And he, was too, he didn't want to take, take, take me on in this race. So the National Democrats went and recruited Julia Browning. I don't know if you've ever heard of Julia Browning. Uh, no one in my district has, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> Julia Brownlee moved to Santa Monica into Ventura County to run for this district, and Nancy Pelosi recruited Julia Brownlee because they felt that she could raise a lot of money from, from West Side LA uh, Democrats in Santa Monica, and they felt that she could raise enough money to, to, to give us a shot and, and try to fight. Make no mistake, she's not well known now, but she will be because they're going to spend millions of dollars to try to knock out the seat. So that, that's where the race is. Tony, did you go to the convention? I, I, the National Convention? Yeah. I did not. And the reason why I didn't go to the convention is because my last week in office, mm -hmm. my, my wife happened to be a delegate uh, from Mitt Romney, and she was a delegate at the convention. But it was funny because I'm on the floor of the Senate, and our last week, we get a thousand bills that last week. The week of the convention was our last week in Sacramento. Business week of the year, and my wife was sending me text messages, having a great time, showing me pictures. Paul <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ryan, and, and I'm sitting there on the floor fighting the good fight that people elected me to do. And an uh, interesting tidbit on the story: I, 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 on Friday night that, that week, at midnight, any any bill that's not done at midnight is dead. Well, there was a two billion dollar tax increase on your vehicle license fee that was being proposed, and there's a couple crazy bills that were being pushed. And it got to be about 11, 1130, 1145. I started to get, raise my mic on every bill, starting to give long speeches, so they kind of knew what I was going to do, what I was doing. So they started ignoring me, um, and they wouldn't call me. Um, but, you know, there's this, there's this lady, Lonnie Hancock, who is a, a senator from Berkeley. 
So you can imagine what a center of convergence is like. <laughs> so I raised the mic and I shouted out really loud, and it was 11:58. And I said, "This is a terrible bill!" And I'm just yelling, "This is the worst bill! Everybody should vote no!" And I went da 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 da, and they ignored me. They went to Lonnie Hancock, but I got her juices flowing so much. She felt that she had a response, and she's like, "Run, jump!" But this is not good at all. She's yelling, and I go, "It's midnight. Bill's dead." <laughs> so, I was out. I was out fighting for you, and so I missed the convention. But and, and I wish I could have seen it. I've seen two bits, but uh, I was doing what people like me to do. Good. 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 Any other? Are there any Democrats in the state legislature that are uh, remotely serious about passing one of your terms of public employee pension funds in the state? Well, I, I will say, um, I'm really serious about pension. Um, you know, I, I think we took a step in the right direction. I was actually shocked at, at what we did get accomplished. And I, I kind of took it from, uh, you know, Neil Armstrong just passed away in my floor speech. Uh, kind of brought back Neil Armstrong. I said, it's a small, one small step for California, one giant missed opportunity for Jerry Brown in California to, you know, really tackle pension. Uh, but we did get some things accomplished. Uh, uh, one of the bills that I've always introduced uh, that has been built, killed in first committee, was the fact I call it the the uh, the Vernon bill. Uh, you know, the the, the, the uh, cities where. This, an uh, employee commits a felony while on the job in the public trust. And you didn't get they didn't get convicted of that felony while doing the public work, they still get their pension. Um, and so I've been fighting this for a long period of time. And I've been fighting this for over three years. And it's been killed. That was part of the pension reform that we got accomplished, got rid of that. The other part was you know how the last year a um, public employee They'll, they'll say they'll say to their spouse, you're not going to see me this year. They work overtime. They cash in all their all their vacation time to boost up that one year salary because that last year's salary is based on your pension based on that last year's salary. So we actually got a three-year average in the pension reform. And the other one that, that is a pet peeve that happens a lot in school districts across the state where someone will work for the, the district and they would retire on Friday they get their pension, they would come back as a consultant the next Monday. So they would double dip. We got that accomplished, so we got that pension reform. We need to get the hybrid. Um, Jerry Brown had a 12-point plan that, you know, quite frankly, did, was, was a very good plan uh, when he came out of the state of state. He had a very good 12-point plan. And us as Republicans, instead of negotiating against ourselves, we took Jerry Brown's plan and said, okay, every Republican member offered that bill. And gave to the Democrats and said, okay, we back your governor's pension reform. Where are you? And they were scrambling the whole year. The whole year they were scrambling. We're, we kept on saying, you're not even doing your own governor's pension plan. So we got about five and a half of those 12 points done. But we missed a giant opportunity to do the overhaul. And the only reason why they did it is because Jerry Brown wants to pass this massive tax increase. And pension people now are paying attention to these pensions, the pension problem that we have. 70, what I call 77% issue. 77% of the California population now is waking up to the problems of the pension system and they want pension reform. Six, eight years ago, no one talked about it. Uh, now, at least we got something done, right? I, I'm afraid that we just did a giant opportunity. And, and, and it tells you how bad the legislature is if Jerry Brown is the most. Uh, is a reasonable person within their party. <laughs> <laughs> but you touched on some of the national issues. Um, in terms of issues affecting the district locally, um, what are those issues? And what are the kind of campaigning for voters looking at the national referendum or the voting on the local issues? Well, um, when I knock door to door, the issue on everybody's mind is the decision of the polling as well as jobs and economy. Um, this is going to be a jobs economy. Uh, as bad as Obama's been on the economy, I actually personally believe his missteps on foreign policy are going to be with us a lot longer, and he's been worse on foreign policy uh, than even the economy. Um, and we're not going to recover from his mistakes over the last four years in terms of international policy. But in terms of my district, one of the, one of the biggest things facing my district right now is the federal budget. 19% of our federal budget is in defense. 
or being proposed in Washington, 50% of the proposed cuts in Washington are reducing defense. So the largest employer in my district is Naval Base Ventura County. And they were going to go two rounds of base realignment closure, and that base will be on the closure list. So they just announced just recently, because they got pushed back, and Panetta got pushed back, that they won't do the base realignment next year, but they'll do it two years from now. Um, but if these deep defense cut, cuts happen, that's going to severely impact my district. Now, I think it's wrong from a local Ventura County perspective and a local economy, because there'll be a huge ripple effect. But I also think it's wrong for America. Because if you ever study history, throughout history, the, the country with the strongest Navy has always had the strongest economy. When Iran says we're going to shut down uh, the Persian Gulf, they don't open up with the kindness of their heart. They only open it up because we send two aircraft carriers there and say we're going to have this free, free flow of commerce. China is building up their Navy right now, today. We've got to be mindful. I believe the way we're successful, America has to lead. Because if America doesn't lead, who does? And we have to be strong, both defense and militarily, and economically. And I think we're projecting weakness right now. What's going on with the Arab Spring, North Korea, and Iran is they don't think they have a strong America right now. They're testing us, and we're, we're failing that test. So when I go to Washington, uh, defense is going to be a big, big part of me building up that, that base and making sure we're strong. Uh, and that's also a local issue. Particularly, particularly uh, uh, maybe the big issue is also West, West Ventura County, the Oxnard, Ventura. That naval base is, is huge for the west part of my, my district, West Ventura County. Tony, you have, uh, you have some insight into other things going on outside the cities of California. Uh, with, in your association with Andy Caldwell and CoLab. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a really ominous situation, uh, the extent to which environmental laws, uh, really environmental fanatics, and the, uh, the application of the Endangered Species Act is literally putting farmers off their land in what could, you know, one of the most productive areas of the world in, in the San Joaquin Valley, and, and particularly uh, even toward the coast. And it, if you could sort of reflect sure. to us yeah. city folks, you know, <coughs> none of us really understand, you know, I, I happen to have dug into it, but most people here in Los Angeles have no idea what's going on, and this, this is a Stalinist-type land reform uh, that, is, that is taking place there. Oh. So, uh, let me address that in a couple of different ways. One, uh, Barack Obama has now created all these czars, and, and the way he's going about uh, his administration on the EPA level, he's loading up a whole bunch of regulators to wreak havoc uh, in terms of Endangered Species Act and also uh, in terms of regulation. Um, you mentioned San Joaquin Valley. If you ever drive uh, up the five, which I do from time to time, going up to Sacramento, um, you'll see big billboards, uh, government created drought. And I've actually had uh, farming families come to my office saying, we've fed the world, our generation, we have generations of families that have owned this farm that fed the world for, for a lifetime. And we can't even feed our kids because of this little delta smell, this little, little itty bitty fish. So the policies also are in these unaccountable boards. We have many unaccountable boards. Uh, the most frequent calls I have in my office is the California Air Resources Board. But we've heard them all, all of the horror stories. Coastal Commission, I'm sure anybody has done anything with Pepperdine and now they're the Coastal Commission. But one of the big problems I have in, in the California legislature that also I'll, I'll have in Washington is we're empowering, and that, by the way, this is what we do in uh, Obamacare. Um, we empower a board that's unaccountable to anybody to make huge decisions. They're going to actually ration health care based on this unaccountable board. In California, we have these unaccountable boards. So if you don't like what the Air Resources Board is doing or the Coastal Commission, and they ignore your voices, there's no recourse. If you don't like the job I'm doing as an elected official, every four years in the State Senate, every two years in Congress or in the State Assembly, you could vote me out. But the legislature and Congress is now putting so much power into unaccountable, and that goes against our democracy. Unaccountable boards goes against our democracy. Let me tell you one quick story on that. Uh, a big farm, the largest broccoli grower 
I believe in the world, to Sheriff Farms. So I go visit to Sheriff Farms, it's the northern part of Santa Barbara. He walks me through, and we do this tour, as I do a lot of different tours, just to understand the policy impacts of what we're doing in Sacramento. At the end, at the very end, he walked me into his office, and he brought up two state agency letters. One state agency, another state agency. And he said, okay, this state agency says, I can't recycle any of my water. And if I recycle any of my water, I get these fines and these penalties. This one says I have to recycle all my water. Fines <laughs> 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 the penalties with it. And he said, Senator, I'm happy to do what you want to do, but I can't recycle none of it and all of it at the same time. <laughs> and that's what's happening right now in terms of regulation. We have unaccountable regulation <coughs> not communicating with each other. And people who want to follow rules can't follow rules because they're getting conflicting and different. We need to streamline the bureaucracy, both at the, at, at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level. <coughs> but we want business to succeed. And uh, as bad as the tax structure is now, I, I'm fearful that the regulatory environment is really what's stifling economic growth. Uh, because, you know, Andy, Andy Puzzle, who is uh, CEO of Carl's Jr., he is, and I'm talking California specific now, so I'm talking California specific. He says from concept to open the doors to open up a new restaurant, a Carl's Jr. restaurant, it takes two years because of the permitting process. It takes three months in Texas. So there's no reason, I mean, so we haven't opened up Carl's Jr. in a long time in California and it's popping up everywhere in Texas. We need to fix that if we want California to be robust and grow. And so that's what needs to happen moving forward. So, Jim, can you frame up uh, what the differences based are between you and your opponent and how you're framing that? We don't have enough time to talk about the differences. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it, like you have at the national level, you could have two more that diametrically opposed people running for office. I believe in the free market. I believe in the power of individuals. And I also, I also believe that you have to have the rules set. If I use again another sports analogy, government is supposed to be there to tell you what's fair and foul, and to say, okay, go to it and create an environment. If you go out of that, their side wants to tell you who the pitcher is, who the catcher is, who the run, and da da da. So uh, my opponent believes in government in almost every facet of your life. Uh, she believes in higher taxes. Um, she also believes in regulation. Um, and she's, done, done, she's just total opposite. Um, and, and by the way, she's far more left than even Barack Obama. She's, she's right there with Nancy Pelosi. That's how far left it is. You know, People's Republic of Santa Monica, I mean, she's gone, gone through Santa Monica, and now she's going into Ventura County. On top of us being diametrically opposed on the issues, also in terms of our community, I grew up in this community. I know this community. She doesn't know the, the difference. She doesn't know the community. I think it's hard to represent a community if you've never been in the community and you don't know what the community is about. Um, and so we're going to be talking about the fact is she voted, by the way, to eliminate the Healthy Families Program, a very popular health care program for uh, young children who couldn't afford health care. It actually proved to work. She voted to eliminate that, and she also voted to release prisoners early based on budget issues. That it's going to be a major problem that you're going to have to tackle uh, with uh, Alan Jackson because of budgetary issues, but at the same time she voted to eliminate those, those programs or release prisoners early. For the very same the very same week, she voted for the high speed rail. I mean the high speed rail, talking about a, a system that we just can't afford. I mean they're cutting education. They're they're asking for the largest tax increase in California history at the ballot, but they're spending billions of dollars uh, in debt service on a train that, that goes from Modesto to Fresno. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, that's the public policy we have in California. It just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. So, instead of reality, so our first dad was talking about Pelosi recruiting Brownlee to move into the district. She voted for high-speed rail while eliminating healthy families and talks about how the health life is for Ventura County jobs. And by the way, the, the commander of Naval Base from Ventura County, Rick Connor, Rick's is called named Garrison Top Gun, Maverick, and it's Brick. It's a pretty cool name. He's co-chair of my campaign, and he's talking about how I'll fight for men and women wearing uniform, and it's more essential than ever that we have a strong leader for our community, for our base. And I'm very proud of that, that support as well. Uh, more of a big issue. Just practically speaking, 
in the next generation called 20 years, do you think there's a chance or a way to stop the next generation for the teachers moving on for the kids who want to be fed on everything? Because it's very, very, you know, we did for ourselves, I think, by a, a terminal. Well, there's a game changer on this November ballot when it comes to that. Um, the Stop Special Interest uh, Stop Special Interest Initiative is on this ballot. And I hear it's polling very well. But this is a very simple ballot. It's, I think it's very carefully drafted. And I think it's something that everybody could, you know, unite around. Saying that you have to be a living, breathing individual to write a campaign contribution. Uh, and then you have to have their, their uh, consent in order to do that. So what that would end up happening is now a teacher uh, that might be supporting me in, in, in Ventura County, her dues get rated and go up without her consent. They take it from her, even though she's supporting my campaign. Uh, and now they will have to actually say, yes, I wanted to go to the union. And now the union, the leaders of the union, will have to actually represent its membership. So that's on the ballot. That will be a game changer for California. And bottom line is, uh, Nancy Pelosi, when we talk about game changers in California, Nancy Pelosi's path to, to the gavel comes through California, Illinois, New York. They believe Obama's going to win, and Obama will win those three states. But we're called what we call orphan districts, meaning that we don't have help from the presidential race. We have no help, and a real significant top of the ticket to help them down ticket. So they think Obama's going to do well, and they're going to capitalize on those three states. Well, that's what they planned on. But uh, they planned on an eight, eight seat pickup in California. And I'll tell you, through Kevin McCarthy's leadership of the whip and a lot of uh, Senate students, we've got good chance in all these districts. I feel very confident that, that we have the ability to either be an even or a pick up a seat in California. Oh. And if we do that, now that all of a sudden builds momentum. Because what we're also doing, Kevin McCarthy uh, has talked to me and others, <coughs> to raise money into this, this, this fund that helps fund probate centers to get out the vote that you would see in Florida, that you would see in Ohio and Virginia and all the swing uh, states in terms of presidential election. We're actually taking a leadership role as candidates and McCarthy and others. Ed Royce has been a huge leader in this. We've all come together and, and helped fund these phone banks. And also, by doing that, we're well, being voters. See, the Democrats have the unions, and they, they do it professionally, and they know where the votes are, and they know how to turn them out in California. We need to build an infrastructure. If we're going to win in California as Republicans, we need to invest in that infrastructure and keep that investment and keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. And by also, we have to go. We have to go to areas that a lot of Republicans uh, like to talk. It's easier for me to talk to you today because you're believers. But I'm going to areas that a lot of other Republicans don't go. Um, last weekend, I had this event where we crowned a, a beauty pageant queen. Uh, 5:30 to 11 p.m. It's all in Spanish. It was the whole thing. I'm there. I'm crowning the queen with the Council General of Mexico. <laughs> The week before, the last three weeks, I'm at a Spanish church, all Spanish. I get there to say a few words in Spanish. Uh, the pastor says, hey, this is a Dali man. I can't tell you who to vote for, but I'm telling you who I'm voting for because he's in the community. And another quick story. Uh, La Colonia is a very tough area in Oxnard. Um, I brought my campaign team. We were going through and we see these gangs all around the street. And we get out there and we go in and there's this boxing gym that Fernando Belgium and uh, it's part of this boxing gym. The famous boxing gym, I think there's 15, 16 world champions that were trained at this small little boxing gym in Oxnard. One, they never ever had a politician ever show up there because it's a rough part of town. And I remember stopping there and then getting out of the car. My campaign manager didn't want to get out of the car. <laughs> I said, let's go. We need to do this. And so I hit it off with the guy who runs the gym. He happens to be one of the top sparring partners for Pacquiao. And uh, we hit it off and we were joking around and doing some boxing and joking around. We had this picture. He's going to help my campaign. He's never said, he's never seen someone. And by the way, I connected. I mean, you can't fake that stuff. Julia Brownlee will not go to La Colonia, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but I'm able to connect, and we need more candidates that are willing to go and connect. And look, my, my manager was scared the whole time. <laughs> but we need to do that. We need, because if they don't hear our message, there's no way that they're going to, we're going to win. They have to hear our message. So we have to take it to them. Let's be in the office. So that's how we win moving forward. <laughs> Tony, how much, how much priority is it for you um, as a congressman to 
helped win back California. You know, it wasn't that long ago that we threw Craig Davis out for Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was this was what happened. But what do you think about that? And what do you think you guys think? Well, I, I think we, we, we can't run before we walk. Um, we have to walk before we jog and before we run. We have to jog. And, and I think a critical part of moving forward is these congressional races in California to build infrastructure in swing areas. But it won't happen overnight. We didn't get here overnight, and we have to build. We have to build and show success. You know, uh, a big frustration, I was on part of the ticket, because we had a very good ticket um, last time, but we didn't win any races. Um, people don't want to find things that just lose from being king. Uh, but we showed success. People want to see and invest in that success. So we have to show we're, we're winning. And I, I forgot to mention it before, but do you realize we have more local electeds that are Republican elected throughout the state of California than Democrats that are local elected? But when they move up, like Steve Cooley, by the way, um, he, he was our candidate for attorney general. He won a landslide here in L.A. County. Won in L.A. County and a landslide three, I believe, three different times. But he ran, and I remember knowing we were the ticket, uh, we were being presented as the ticket. I went to Cooley. I've known Steve for a long time. I said, you just need to get 40% of the vote. This is what Matt worked. 40% of the vote in L.A. County, and you're going to be attorney general. And he laughed at me. He said, dude, that's three lands. I'm going to win L.A. County. I said, no, 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 hold on. You're going to have R next to your name. It's going to be a lot harder than the nonpartisan. He still got, you know what he got? He got 39.8%. Of the vote. And so he barely missed the attorney general race because of brain. Tim O'Brien can tell you a little bit about brain. Uh, by the way, why don't we bring experts to our elected officials? Uh, I went out and I was fortunate enough that Tim was kind enough to come and talk to our joint caucus because Tim had something to say about brain. And Tim was awesome. In fact, we raided all the legislators. We had Carl Rove there. We had all these people come in and we had this big retreat. I brought Tim because I thought he had a important message to about brain and how we improved the brain in California. And Every legislator really is because this kid got the best ratings here and Carl Rove and everybody else. But we need that kind of leadership from the private sector that says, this is how you get things done. And we need to learn. Um, I think we're going to take California back. I really do. And I think all of us are missed the boat. Honestly, uh, we had a tremendous opportunity with a lot of momentum, and we didn't get it done. The bottom line is we missed a golden opportunity. We tried to boil the ocean a little bit. Well, he didn't take advantage of the, the mandate that he had in the recall. And he had the ability. I was there. And I remember he got mad at me. But I said, look, we can do a balanced budget right now. And since you're only going to go down the population plus inflation. And I knew Herb Wesson was speaker at the time. He's now president of the United States. friend of mine. Herb was petrified. Every Democrat was petrified of Arnold Schwarzenegger as governor because he did so well in their district. He could have got accomplished in the first year anything he wanted. But he didn't go for the juggler. He didn't get that reform. He negotiated that out for a higher recovery bond. And that was the first day that I thought we missed the opportunity. If we got that spending cap in, we would not have a deficit today. Um, but he missed that opportunity. And then after the year went by, he then went on and took on probably too many other initiatives and said there's been a victory and we lost. And then instead of saying, okay, we lost, like most people don't know this, but Howard Jarvis and Paul Dan failed in 1976 on the property tax initiative, and then they went forward again to step in and got accomplished. Just because you lose an election doesn't mean you give up your whole thing and go 180 degrees the other way. Mm -hmm. You say, okay, I fell short, learned from your shortcoming, then come back. If it's the right thing to do, it's the right thing to do. And that's what I was hoping that would happen that did not happen. Uh, nothing against the gentleman, but he missed the opportunity that we had. We had a golden opportunity kind of take back the state and miss it. Hopefully, we take advantage of the next opportunity that we have in California. Because again, California is worth fighting for. Doctor. I just want to make a comment. Nobody's telling you, when you ran against Hannah Beth Jackson, uh, fairly well-placed Democrat actually was pulling for you. But the reasons he gave were we can work with him, he understands the Republicans, he will know and tell us honestly what the Republicans will agree to and not. And because he's there, even though he might not be in the leadership, we know that if Tony is on board, he's done, he's not and uh, 
you're just quite serious. You don't want to see hands passed up there because she, nobody's working with her. Right. They can work with you. Right. And I think that's something important for everyone here to know, that you are that type of a, an elected official. You're there to get things done. Well, one of the things I'm very proud of um, is a lot of Democrats are my friends, and we do work together, again, being a statesman, to get things accomplished for the future of this country, the future of the state. And I think a lot of us need, the, I think the good ones in Sacramento or in Washington are able to understand their, their district, understand their life experience, where they come from. I mentioned my father being a criminal, too, so there's no question that's ingrained in who I am as a person. But everybody has different life experiences, and, and the good leaders are willing to understand you and where you're coming from in your community and create win-win scenarios. That's what leadership's about, and that's what I've been fighting for, and I've got a great relationship. And wait till you see some of my ads. I have some, I have some doozy ones coming up, and I talk about me being effective and being able to get things done. So I know I'm going to hook, but if I can. <laughs> <laughs> it might just end. Yeah, uh, but I want to end my original speech. Um, I want to end my original speech. I need my original speech. I need your help. If you like what you heard today, I need your help. Because the other side is going to go all in. And I would hate to see me lose by one or two points because people didn't step up. I will work as hard as I can, but I can't do it alone. If you're willing to write, take your credit card right now, write a credit card donation, small contribution, large contribution, whatever you can do. You look back at our founders. They gave up their life fortunes. They gave up their lives. A lot of folks that my dad served with in Korea and Vietnam gave up their lives for the very freedoms we enjoy today so we can talk today. We're not asked to give up a lot. I'm not asked to give up a lot. We're not, but if you can do from the bottom of your heart, if you believe in this and you believe in this cause, please write a contribution because we will get across the finish line and we will make a difference. So thanks so much. All right.